invitation from uh, Dr. Banshi. Should I give a very mechanistic uh, talk? Uh, and I thought about that very long, long time because there's a lot of things that we have learned in the, through the cardiovascular outcome trials and the dedicated renal trials. But I decided that since we are also clinicians. We need to understand the problem. So this will be a much, much more pragmatic and, and clinically related talk. So these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, and uh, the first take home message from my talk is basically that diabetic kidney disease is common and the consequences are gr grim. So we need to screen for diabetic kidney disease. This, uh, this um, study was done quite a few years ago, the demand study by Hans Riparvin, our friend from Denmark, at the random screening for the presence of uh, an increased albumin excretion rate in the urine or a reduced EGFR of both. You can see that on a global scale, more than every second patient had signs of chronic kidney disease. If you go to Asia, even more common. So diabetic kidney disease is common. And then if you look at what are the consequences of that, on the left-hand side, you can see that uh, albuminuria, the more albuminuria you have, uh, the more likely you are to uh, develop kidney disease or progress in terms of the kidney disease, but also uh, to have cardiovascular events. But also you can see that when you lose kidney function, exactly the same. So diabetic kidney disease is something that comes with grim consequences. And also you had the previous, the previous session here on heart failure. On the left-hand side, you can see that when patients lose kidney function, there is an increased risk of ending up in hospital because of heart failure. On the right-hand side, the more albumin that leaks into the urine, the more likely the patients are to end up in hospital. And in essence, if you have a 60-year-old uh, patient with type 2 diabetes, you can expect six years shorter life expectancy. If that patient has suffered a myocardial infarction or a stroke, you can expect 12 years shorter life expectancy. However, take into account if you, the patient hasn't su suffered a myocardial infarction or stroke yet, but you find the early signs of diabetic kidney disease, 16 years shorter life expectancy. So this said, diabetic kidney disease is common, the consequences are grim, and we need to identify the patients with diabetic kidney disease, and we need to take action. So please screen, screen, screen for, di for the presence of diabetic kidney disease. That is the way how we can improve the, pro the prognosis of our patients. So what should we do when I say we need to take action? We all know the standard of care, and the, uh, I usually, the pragmatic view for me is five-finger rule, uh, so in this slide, you can see optimal glycemic control in A1C below 7, optimal blood uh, pressure control below 130 or 80, the use of ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and also a study. The fifth finger is actually stop smoking. And if we do this, we can actually do a lot of good to our patients. These are data from the STNO2, very small study, but but in, in 160 patients, but it, what it showed us that if you put everything you have means to treat diabetes and diabetic complications on the desk, you can achieve something. You can see intensively treated group, much, much less risk of cardiovascular events. But also here you can see that less risk of, of diabetic kidney disease. Now, this slide from Julia Chan in Hong Kong showed that quite a few years ago that the more targets you can achieve, the better you're off. You can see if you achieve less than th three treatment targets or more, you can see that you can, you can dramatically reduce the risk of, of uh, uh, of instability disease and premature death. So we need to do something. And the, 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 the standard of care is fine. However, the big problem is seen here. You can see that we still have a lot more to do. There is an unmet need. And if you then just look at the, the wonderful landmark studies, Renal and IDMT, uh, we could improve the, the relative risk uh, for ending up on dialysis in the renal and also the, in the IDNT. But again, there is substantial residual risk. So we need, we need to do more. And the good news is then 
we have means nowadays, but let's first have a look at what is driving the progression of kidney disease and how can we then try to address uh, uh, what happens uh, in, in the progress of the kidney disease. So this slide shows that the drivers of chronic kidney disease in type 2 diabetes, but also in non-diabetic kidneys is basically the same. First of all, we have hemodynamic effects, we have metabolic effects, uh, and we have been used to address these effects quite a long time already. However, what we have not addressed in the treatment is the third part, which is inflammation and fibrosis. All these three together, so the hemodynamic, the metabolic, and the inflammatory fibrotic pathways, they lead to tubal interstitial damage and inflammation, glomerular sclerosis, mesangial expansion, glomerular hypertrophy, and kidney fibrosis. Now, whenever you find a sign in your patient of a reduce in the EGFR, that is basically a sign that the patient ha will have fibrosis in the kidneys because the early stages, you have more uh, increased albuminuria, rate, albuminuria. That is a sign of early signs, er, early, uh, uh, early diabetic kidney disease, and it's more of an integrity of the podocytes, how they work. But when you see a reduction in EGFR, then you also have, have a signs of fibrosis. So all these together, they drive the progression of kidney disease. So what can we then do? The hemodynamic uh, uh, part, we have already addressed nicely, quite a long, uh, uh, many years already. And it's all in the guidelines that in the five finger rule, you should use ACE inhibitors, angiotensin, ARPs. And we, with those, we actually dilate the different arteriole. So we reduce the intraglomerular pressure in the kidneys. But now recently we also learned that by SGLT2 inhibitors, we can have hemodynamic effects by closing the afferent artery. The HTLT2 inhibitors, they are also by definition glucose low medications and have effects on the metabolic side. So do the GLP-1 receptor agonists and also DPP-4 inhibitors. And one of the DPP-4 inhibitors, linagliptin, is also reducing albuminuria. So we have medications that definitely work on the metabolic side. So hemodynamic and metabolic side. However, we have not yet addressed uh, uh, the inflammation and fibrosis. So uh, now I will focus also a little bit on what we can achieve by addressing that one. So let, let's just uh, have a, <clears throat> a short uh, uh, and a brief uh, uh, resume of the big, big studies. I know that you have seen during these two days, these slides many, many times, but repetition uh, is the mother of studying, so repetitio studiorum mater est in Latin. So let's see what we have learned from the SGLT2 inhibitors. The first out was Empereg outcome trial. That was uh, reported on the 17th of September 2015 in Stockholm. REG stands for removal of excess glucose. So that was a glucose lowering medication, removing excess glucose. And it was a wonderful effect on the cardiovascular death. So Suddenly, we had, to, by definition, glucose lowering medication that can, can reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and uh, a three-point maze. However, what well, also the Empereg showed that we can have dramatic effects on preventing the progression of kidney disease, as shown in this slide. Those data were then replicated by the Canvas program. Uh, similar data. So uh, SGLT2 inhibitor can actually prevent the progression or, or the risk of ending up with a composite renal endpoint. And very nicely shown in this slide here, you can see that an initial drop in the EGFR, which is a hemodynamic effect, you can see that we can preserve the kidney function. So this was something absolutely new and astonishing results and definitely that will improve the prognosis of our patients. Now, but those two trials, uh, so the Empire Gaucon trial and the Canvas and also the, the, the Claire Timi and Virtis, I'm not going to show data from them, they were not designed uh, to test the effect on the kidneys. They were cardiovascular outcome trials. Credence was the first dedicated renal trial. So, and that actually asked 
whether uh, maybe we or can we with an HLT2 inhibitor actually uh, reduce the risk of a composite kidney endpoint. And the Dublin or serum creatinine is a very hard endpoint. It's basically 57% reduction in GFR. And you can see a 30% reduction when you combine it with cardiovascular death. But look what happens when you get rid of the cardiovascular death, but only look at the kidney. Kidney outcomes, an even stronger effect. And these data were also replicated in another dedicated renal trial, the DAPA CKD, here in combination with a renal and cardiovascular endpoint, but when you if you get rid of the, of the cardiovascular endpoint, even stronger effect. And this is not unexpected because these medications work through the kidneys and have then effects, secondary effects on the heart. But we can discuss that later on. Now, also very interestingly, we have now dedicated heart failure trials too. And you can see that in the emperor reduced uh, by, by uh, changing the, the, the slope and you had an improvement in the slope, so plus 1.73 ml per minute. That was translated into a dramatic effect on the risk of a composite renal endpoint. So it has a ratio of 0.50, so 50% reduction in, uh, uh, in a kidney uh, uh, endpoint in a dedicated heart failure trial. You remember what I said? Who are the patients that develop heart failure? They are kidney patients. The less the kidneys function, the more albumin that leaks into the urine, the more likely you are to develop heart failure. And when you do a meta-analysis of the emperor reduced and the DAPA-HF, you can see that wonderful effect on the, the, the kidneys. Now, I told you that we have not yet uh, uh, used medications that address the fibrotic part. So let me give you some data from, from uh, uh, two uh, recently reported trials, the Fidelio DKD and the Figaro DKD. So the Fidelio DKD, that was a kidney outcomes trial, while the Figaro was a cardiovascular outcome trial. So basically in the Fidelio, they looked at, at more uh, uh, advanced kidney disease and in the Figaro, much, much less kidney disease. One important uh, note here is that these trials did not include any patients with non-albuminuric kidney disease, and that is about 20% of our patients with type 2 diabetes. Well, we can, uh, with the diabetic kidney disease, we can come back to that later on. So the Fidelio and the Figaro program, and Fidelio showed very nicely that on top, on top of RAS therapy, it reduced the, the, the uh, kidney endpoint here, defined as kidney failure and then 40% decrease in EGFR. This is uh, uh, actually uh, approved by the FDA and it's very often used nowadays. And you can see there's 18% reduction in the, uh, uh, the risk of a composite endpoint, a renal endpoint. Also, at the same time, there were an effect on cardiovascular death, non fatal myocardial infarction, non fatal stroke, or ending up in hospital because of of, of heart failure. So Fidelio showed not only renal protective, but also cardioprotective effects. What about then, uh, was the, could that be then used on top of STLT2 inhibitors? The problem with the Fidelio, only 4.6% of the patients were on STLT2 inhibitors. But what we can see on the right hand side, the effect was seemed to be even stronger on albuminuria. This is not a proof, but it tells us that there might be additive effects. And also the GLP-1 receptor agonist here, slightly uh, more pronounced effect in those uh, with GLP-1 receptor agonist at baseline or now on phenomenon. So what about then the other figure? That was a cardiovascular outcome trial. And then, of course, the primary outcome was, was a, a cardio, uh, cardiovascular outcome. You can see here 13% reduction. What about then uh, the, 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 the heart failure? Very interestingly in the Figaro, the main driver of the effects on the heart, on, on the heart was actually heart failure. And now if you think about aldosterone works on the distal tubal and the collecting ducts, ducts in order to uh, retain sodium and water, to have a balanced uh, fluid balance in, 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 in the body. Now, if you then have an exaggerated or overexpressed production of aldosterone, you will actually push that, you will retain more sodium. And when you block that, you actually will have uh, uh, a positive uh, change. And you can see that the effect is actually very much driven by hospitalization for heart failure. Now, what about then in the, in the 
in the phenome, so in the figure of trial, the kidney. And so the 40% decrease was not significant. However, there was a trend, uh, so 0.87, but not significant. If you then look at the the doubling of serum creatinine is 57%, then uh, a 23% uh, reduction. But this was not uh, basically pre-specified as the, the, the secondary outcome. And then less patients end up on, dial on dialysis. However, both these trials, the, the Fidelio in the, the advanced kidney disease and Figaro early kidney disease, they showed that uh, the, the cardiac protection and also, depending on how you look at the data, also in the figure of if you use the 57% reduction in GFR, you have a beneficial effect also on the kidneys. Fidelity was a meta-analysis in more than 13,000 patients from those both these studies. And you can see when you look at the effect on the kidneys, 23% reduction. So yet another means how to address the problem. So let me now uh, give you a few take-home messages uh, uh, from, from, from this talk. And I have said it many, many times, and I'm pretty sure many of you have heard me say this many, many times, but I will repeat, because the problem around the globe is that we don't screen for the presence of diabetic kidney disease. Unfortunately, we don't do that. If you go out and look at throughout the world, it's between 10 and 45%. That is the screening. It should be 100. So diabetic kidney disease is common and the consequences are grim. And we, of course, need to take action. The standard of care, the multifactorial treatment is recommended to all patients with type 2 diabetes and diabetic kidney disease, but the treatment effects leave still a substantial unmet need. But the good news are that SGLT2 inhibitors, as well as mineral cortical receptor uh, antagonist Finermel, provide effective tools to improve the prognosis of our patients with type 2 diabetes and diabetic kidney disease, since they have not only been shown to be cardioprotective, but also renal protective. And these are extremely, extremely good news. So, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, my last uh, uh, conclusion here is that active screening for, diabetes, for the presence of diabetic kidney disease and implementation of the novel agents uh, uh, should be on top of the agenda to help our patients. The problem, for instance, SGLT2 inhibitors, if you look at how they are implemented around the globe, 7%. 7%. So very few patients still are on these life-saving uh, cardioprotective and real protective effects. And now we have uh, another phenomenon. And my dear hope is that you guys go out and screen for the present diabetic kidney disease. And after that, you take action. And thank you for your attention.